Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Al Fiori. Uh, my background is in criminal investigation. And I had a question for Artis Velt, if I may. Uh, the question is, uh, in connection with the mayor, how uh, did he come to your attention, or the state police or the law enforcement? And secondly, which is quite related, how did you manage to secure evidence? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll take a couple more and then okay. uh, come back to you. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll start with the middle. No one's, no hands on the left or right. Uh, <laughs> gentleman down there, right next to you. Um, th thank you very much. My, my question is really for everybody, uh, but please particularly- Please yourself as well. Yeah, particularly the lady from the World Bank. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm the former uh, UK Customs Intelligence Analyst for Transnational Organized Crime in the ex- Soviet countries, and last year after I left customs, I was at Terra Hova, and I thought your presentation absolutely got the uh, key oh. points uh, on a global level, and the fact that there's somebody here from Latin America, somebody here from the Baltics, and somebody here from West Africa has become clear with my next my question. My question is based on a study planned for Guinea-Bissau, and also the experiences of a colleague who worked in Uganda about 10 years ago. And it is how genuinely um, committed to joined up working are some of the more development agencies. Um, Tom Clancy, who died recently in all the books he wrote himself, he always used two phrases. W both highly relevant here. One was, there's no substitute for looking people in the eye. Um, do the people in agencies like the World Bank really want to do this, or, or, or are they doing it because they're told to? 70-page World Bank stud proposal for a reform and modernization of the customs service of Guinea-Bissau. This was in early 2009. I was reading this a few weeks before the president had the army chief killed, the army, chief, the army retaliated by killing the president, and that was just two weeks before Frederick Forsyth arrived in Guinea-Bissau. In that 70-page report, there was not one word about drugs trafficking. Right, thank uh, you. You'll understand I'm skeptical. Thank you very much. Um, and then one final question, lady in the second row, come back. Thank you, um, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Lucia uh, Duwe. Um, I'm from the Zimbabwe Diaspora Focus Group. Uh, my question is from the three of you. It's just a simple one. W when you did all your research or your investigations, were you able to present your research findings within the country, or you are only safe to present them outside the country? The reason why I'm, I'm asking this is I, I have a project in mind uh, following what Francisca uh, was talking about of how um, probably we can work uh, together, with that is uh, individual civil society or governments in combating corruption. And mine is thinking of starting from the grassroots. And uh, I was wondering how safe it was mm. for all of you to present your findings. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Artis, why don't we start with the direct question, and then we'll have the, uh, the more open questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> yes, that was a um, very long operation, as I said. It takes more than five years, and um, it was crime intelligence, of course. Uh, it, everything was starting in crime intelligence. Uh, criminal police, uh, of course, have agents and so on, so uh, they knew the persons who are working in that uh, criminal environment. And But official start, uh, uh, if I remember rightly, was uh, some, um, some, some, some um, papers or, or calls from the drivers at the row, who were standing in the row, and they was a uh, um, little bit... Uh, there was a surprise that uh, they, they saw that uh, many cars are not standing in a row but starting to cross the 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 the, the, the cross border like uh, in a green line and there was a uh, rumors that it's uh, possible just you need to pay 150 euros for the, that reason and then you don't need to stay where to pay how to pay for whom to pay and that was official start of that case so and the the, the second part of question I'm 
Yes, uh, it's um, like in, uh, let's say, ordinary criminal procedures. It's a um, co cooperation with uh, many law enforcement agencies. That was not only state police, but uh, we have a special bureau uh, who are uh, dealing with corruption. Let's say uh, there was a special witness protection programs as well, so there's um, several types. And very briefly, on how safe do you feel talking about this in Latvia? <coughs> yes, um, I can say very openly that, 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 that is um, everything I said or showed in my presentation actually comes from the public uh, sources. So um, I hope and uh, believe we are a democratic, democratic country, so you can say what you think, what you, uh, <laughs> and then and, and, and present your findings, and, and, and so it's uh, your choice. Of course, uh, it is publicly open, and um, many, uh, when, when I joined the uh, project, so uh, we used a lot of information, which is uh, just put it in the internet, I uh, thought so it like uh, journalists' uh, findings, and, and so it's very open, actually. Great, thank you. Um, Francesca, what, I'd like to start with you on the question of um, will, the will to actually address th these issues in a meaningful way. Are you just doing this because you're told to, or are you looking at this because it's important and there is will to do so at the World Bank? Well, um, this is a very interesting uh, question. I wish I could be there in person. Um, <laughs> So two, two, um, two quick reactions. The World Bank is not uh, something that is disjoint from the politics uh, that we are talking about. Let me, let's be very frank about this. We are uh, governed by a governance structure where uh, any decision to be engaged either on an issue or in a country are run by our Board of Governors. And go who sits on our Board of Governors? Uh, or representative from all the country of the world. You can question the, who has more voting power, who has less voting power, but at the end of the day, believe me, I've sat at some of those meetings, you actually will be surprised who is pushing for not um, addressing some of this issue more openly. And, uh, and here, you know, it's really because I go back to the point that I was emphasizing at the end. When we talk about uh, uh, some not little bribe payment, but some large issue that involves a big piece of the pie, um, and we want to make sure that that pie is distributed in a more fair, transparent, and equitable way, um, we are really touching issue of power. And, and that's where we struggle a little bit. Because this is, uh, uh, inside the World Bank, a decision are taken collectively. And any time that the decision is taken, maybe we should go back and ask our own government, uh, what was your voting inside the World Bank? Did you support this or no? First question. First part of my answer. Um, second part of my answer. Despite this um, overview of the governance structure of the bank that might leave you a little bit of a cynical taste in your mouth, there are a large community. There is a large community of practitioners inside the World Bank and also outside uh, that really believe this is important for the reason I try to quickly share with you. Without addressing this issue, we cannot move forward. Do we do it because we are told to? Mm, no, not necessarily. There is a lot of, remember that a large part of bank staff, World Bank staff are economists, so we look at the evidence. We are not making progress, not as fast as we would like. We, not even in other sectors, infrastructure project, health project, education project, are not having the impact that we would like because we are not addressing this other issue. And so together, we really believe that we need to address this issue to move forward. Now, you also touched to the issue of the role and the collaboration, the coordination with, let me call, from lack of a better word, developed country, European country, OECD country. That also is an issue, because these problems are very common, and as every day we open the newspaper, in, you know, in Europe, in the U.S., everywhere in the world, there are issues of how power was distributed and allocated in a way that was not fully 
transparent, not based on the principle that we all think that was important it would be based on. And, and so this is a struggle that is common to every country, even to the country that should, in terms of capacity, and provide the leadership and give the example of how things should be done. So let me stop there. I want to give more time for other questions. But this, was, this is a very important point. Thank you for raising it. Great, thank you, Francesca, um, and thanks for being so candid about it. Uh, Catalina or Frank, would either of you like to comment on this issue of uh, lack of will in some of these multilateral agencies, but also how safe do you feel talking about this back home um, rather than sort of on an international stage like this? Frank? Okay, um, well, uh, to begin with uh, about yeah, the general will to work uh, on these issues. I mean, I can more uh, I can talk about uh, our will uh, from international idea, uh, and certainly there there is a will, uh, but uh, there is a lot of interest. But uh, there are uh, significant challenges. So um, um, this came to our attention, and we started working on this uh, because in 2010 Mexico was the it was chairing the Council of Ideas. So Idea is also an intergovernmental organization, and as such, we are also responding to our member states. Uh, but we have member states uh, from like so-called you can say traditional developing and developed countries, and in this case, Mexico facing these issues from within. They were very interested in us. Uh, further investigating uh, some of these issues. So this is how we started working on this. And um, as uh, more and more our member states see the need for us to further pursue these issues and see the connection with larger discussions in terms of security, then it becomes more clear the need to do this. Um, this is not just an, uh, an issue of the democratic uh, uh, or democratic systems being threatened, but r like a larger extent, uh, it's, a, it's also a security issue and not in terms of uh, the traditional violence issue. Because, for example, in Bello and in many other of the cases we've studied, actually violence level have uh, decreased. And as Camino was pointing out, uh, it's somehow f um, uh, may it obscures uh, the issue of uh, these uh, structures being developed from within. So for us, this is at the forefront of our interest, uh, and it touches upon other areas that we're working on, such as elections, political parties, constitution building, etc. So, uh, but it is indeed uh, very hard uh, some at times to to liaise uh, with uh, national actors because indeed. Uh, <coughs> It's a bit of a vicious cycle. Uh, we are we need to work with uh, our local counterparts, but it is basically the political actors who are our counterparts and who are uh, some t in some cases uh, m m like uh, yeah linked to this issue. So it, it is a bit of a uh, there are some places we can work and there are some places where we just need to wait and uh, until the timing is right. Uh, and regarding safety. Well, it depends really on the place, and I would um, think, uh, for example, uh, doing this in Latin America, I mean, in the Baltic states, uh, we were able to go, we also carried out many interviews, and it was fairly open, and um, with some exceptions. But um, in Latin America, one of our researchers, for example, in Honduras, um, we are publishing a book about this, and uh, we couldn't include uh, the case study from Honduras, for example, because uh, the case uh, during the course of his uh, study was developing at the same time, and um, uh, he his life was threatened, not di directly because of this uh, investigation, but he, he didn't feel comfortable. So it, we have had mm -hmm. difficulties also uh, coming uh, and doing this research. Um, so one needs to be aware of uh, the challenges and difficulties of uh, bringing some of these cases to light. So it's rather easier, in a way, when uh, as in the, the case I showed, uh, the case has been prosecuted, um, but um, from like threats uh, to life to like more simple concerns of liability also because we are talking about people uh, who are sometimes still uh, part of the political system, then yeah, uh, we, we need to know how and who to work with. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Let me just quickly add that uh, from a civil society perspective, um, there has recently been an increase uh, in the interest to fight uh, organized crime, especially within uh, Ghana and West Africa. But uh, these efforts are also being inhibited 
by the lack of access to information. Uh, in Ghana, for instance, um, the Freedom of uh, Information Bill has been warming the shelf for over eight years, and people have be begun to lose interest in whether this will be passed into law. Uh, the Whistleblowers Act, for instance, is nowhere to be found. And um, there is that lack of uh, capacity because at the level of um, the legislature, it is also very difficult for them to raise some of these issues and bring them into light because they also depend on the executive to b for resources and, and whatnot. But uh, let me also say that at the level of government, whether there is a will uh, or not, but it, they have also stepped up operation to um, stem the tide of, for instance, drug trafficking, working in collaboration with the uh, US law enforcement agencies and also UK law enforcement agencies. But the effect of that is that um, they, it, they have led to the arrest of low-level drug peddlers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that the statistics of arrest of low-level drug peddlers is not really reliable when we want to tackle a crime as gigantic as um, drug trafficking. So there is the will on the part of civil society, but they are also constrained mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And in talking about it, well, we, we deal with the West African sub-region, and therefore most of our efforts have been focused there. And we know very well the interlinkages between uh, crime in Ghana, Guinea Bissau, uh, Mali, and, and whatnot. So we do recognize that. But some of the time, there are political sensitivities that also make it very difficult to come out openly uh, to talk about some of these things. So that has also been another issue we are a bit particular about, uh, not to, you know, so. Have you ever personally felt insecure as a result of your work? Well, uh, personally, I, I wouldn't say. Sometimes um, we do face challenges, but we do conduct um, our security analysis mm -hmm. before we do come out or also go into mm -hmm. certain situations. So that has not arisen yet, but we do pay particular attention mm -hmm. to the sensitivity so that we don't find ourselves in that situation. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to come back to the middle. I know there are a couple more questions. I'd like to take uh, some from the left. Um, yeah, gentleman in front right here, and then Alina. We'll take two or three, and yeah, we'll, we'll I'll come to that side of the room as well, and then swing back to the middle. Yes, please. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sean Hillhorst. Um, I work for the UK government, um, currently with Edge and Revenue and Customs, previously with the Foreign Office, and about to move to the Department for International Development. So I'm kind of doing a circuit round. Um, but I have two slightly selfish questions to try and draw on your, some of the expertise of the panel today. Um, firstly, uh, the, a government such as the UK's that wants to drive an international agenda that tackles some of the issues we've been talking about has various levers at its t disposal, uh, aid being one of them, but also the traditional trade and diplomatic levers, uh, yeah. the law enforcement agencies that, that you mentioned are working down. If you've got two questions, I'm going to insist they're quick ones. OK. Um, mm. what, where does an aid agency have the comparative advantage over other levers that a government can use uh, in this field? That's the first one. And the second one is, um, where can we go to find out more? Um, because a lot of governmental policy making has to be based on evidence and research and this kind of thing. And we are starting to fund uh, more research, but what is out there? Where, where can we go to find out empirical information about the things that we're talking about? Great, thank you. Alina? Um, thank you, Alina Rocha Menocal from ODI. Um, what struck me about the different presentations and a little bit of what the, our um, speakers on the, on the non-video conference uh, said, uh, is that there's a lot of um, similarity um, across regions about sort of the really uh, perverse impact that uh, illicit uh, money can have on politics and the quality of democratic representation. And it seems to me that because there is so much money involved and it is such a lucrative business going to the point of power, I am not entirely sure how you can actually protect politics unless you take radically different steps. And I think the big elephant in the room is whether or not there's much more that needs to be done about actually considering legalizing drugs at mm -hmm. the international level. Uh, great, thank you. More of a comment, but if anyone wants to well, touch on that. 
Uh, got yeah, very enthusiastic question <laughs> there. <laughs> well, we have to have that one. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tamru from Ethiopia. Uh, uh, the example which I'm using of is from Ethiopia. I don't know why it is seen as a um, needed research even uh, because these things they do it publicly. I'll, I'll give you a good example of from Ethiopia case. Out of 62 or something like that generals, um, one or two of them only from uh, other ethnic group. The other 60 of them from one ethnic group. And this is, <laughs> so I don't know why research is needed. And, and they are members of uh, this, uh, you know, boards and they are millionaires and everybody knows. <laughs> so, you know, it's just uh, what I couldn't understand is all the energy of where know about it. Where's the mystery, right, yeah. is the question. Why is it a mystery? Okay, why? Well one ethnic group is, uh, you know, ruling sure. for 20 years. So, why not we expect corruption? Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. Thank you very much. Was there any, any more questions on this side now? Okay, well, we'll take one more. Yeah, there's a gentleman on the other side as well. <coughs> yes. Uh, my my name is uh, Warsame. I'm from Somalia. Working with the UN. But uh, at, this, at this forum, I'm on my own. I personally am representing myself. Um, I have uh, the, the speaker from the World Bank repeatedly stated that we're not doing what we were supposed to do. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, are we reaching a point where we now should reinvent ourselves and think out of the box and um, do maybe uh, some radical, uh, radical institutional uh, strengthening instead of thinking the other way around. Um, if our institutions are not um, equipped, I mean, uh, to tackle. And you mean international institutions? International right. institutions, the current problems. Yeah. Are we, are we in a stage now that we have to uh, rethink and reinvent ourselves? So our agencies like the World Bank are the date, World Bank. I'm talking about World Bank. And also, uh, the another question for the World Bank is that uh, how multinational corporations that often uh, the World Bank contract is to do some infrastructure works in the in, in, in the countries that they work uh, do contribute to the what we are talking about okay. to this uh, 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 corruption and uh, lastly for Ghana <laughs> I was uh, I was amazed to hear about Ghana because uh, myself I thought Ghana is much ahead than the rest of Africa so um, you said the civil society are keen to do something. What about uh, the uh, the other uh, other institutions, the other the judiciary, uh, the, um, the 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 the, uh, the parliament? What what about other institutions? Not not only civil society. Sure. Uh, how they see this uh, this problem in Ghana? Because it's quite shocking to hear to Ghana from yeah. this. To paraphrase that, the state, effectively. Yeah, yes, yeah. They what's, state, the what's the state, state not doing state. anything? Okay, well, why don't we start with Ghana, and then we can uh, move on to some of the other issues. Okay. So, um, apart from civil society, well, you have the executive uh, represented by the office of the president, you have the judiciary, and you also have the legislature. And I did uh, mention earlier on about um, the factors that inhibit the work of the legislature uh, in terms of uh, the political patronage because the president has such extensive powers to be able to curtail some of their actions in terms of oversight. And that is uh, the, the, the framework within which the legislature operates in Ghana. Uh, but the judiciary, it's, a, it's especially inhibited by a lack of resources. You, you have um, judges who are not well paid, uh, you have a lot of bottlenecks in the uh, uh, legal processes. And therefore, you know, they also don't have that kind of freedom to do the work that they are really taxed to do. But um, they all do, we do acknowledge that they have been trying to do their best within the circumstances that uh, they are permitted to work. Uh, but uh, due to s some of these factors I have mentioned concerning the legislature, it becomes very difficult for them to operate because they work very closely with the security uh, service agencies that are also captured by the, the, the state. 
So it becomes, I, I will cite uh, one example of uh, recent uh, cocaine that was being presented uh, as evidence that got lost and has never been able to be traced. And uh, you have the uh, judi uh, judiciary expecting evidence to be presented for them to be able to prosecute the case, but uh, the security services are compromised and therefore it becomes very difficult for them to even get the evidence to prosecute some of these offenders. So basically, this is what the, how the, the whole framework of organized crime works in, in Ghana. But uh, I must say that um, compared to other countries within West Africa, I must say that um, our situation is not, it's not exclusive to Ghana, but uh, maybe we are even better off than uh, other countries within the West African sub-region. Which is good for Ghana, but not very not good news for, <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of West Africa. Um, Artis, I'd like to put the uh, question of legalizing drugs to you because you're a lawman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alina mentioned, I mean, it's, it is the elephant in the room, isn't it? Is it time to start seriously talking about legalizing, probably not all drugs, but some of them? <laughs> and, and those who are giggling are, remember, there are police officers in the room. Be careful. <laughs> 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 so I believe this is only an um, opinion, so because then we need another one, a seminar or conference about it. No, I think it will never happen because there's a lot and a lot of uh, researchers who have proven that uh, the drugs, they are, uh, they are um, a real threat for society. So even uh, if, we, if we, in one day, one in some country, they will start to provide for free. So uh, it will be um, anarchy in that country and that's, um, that's all because the drugs, they are change uh, people's mind and uh, behavior, so, and they are very dangerous in the, under the drug influence, so this is a danger, why drugs are so dangerous, so, so probably it will never happen. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, of course, there is a very, very um, strong link between politics and drugs, because uh, drug, um, drugs and drug market and drug criminality, it's a global market. Of course, uh, they are starting somewhere <coughs> in Colombia, <laughs> if we talk about one type of drugs, and they are moving all around the world. And of course, it's not so easy just to put in a bag and uh, uh, to take with you in a plane. So this is a real market, and uh, without support from politicians, without from support from uh, state institutions, it, it's it's not possible to, to, to work in that market. So, of course, it, it's a, it is a problem not only for politicians but only for all law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, it's um, yeah, it's a b big challenge, and and uh, I'm also a little bit skeptic or, or about uh, how we we can go in uh, in the future because it's it it will never end. I think. <laughs> Katarina, are you going to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> <I've> <laughs> Do you want to say anything? You don't have to, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> well, I, um, I think, um, speaking for myself, uh, not speaking um, uh, on behalf of uh, an organization, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, maybe uh, it's a just a need to have maybe, um, as our colleague from uh, Somalia was pointing out, a bit more innovative solutions uh, that are not just this one one single approach to the drug problem or to organized crime in general. So this uh, war on drugs or it's uh, it has proven to be um, a failure in some contexts and I think Latin America is uh, a good example of how this uh, increasing money available from organized crime uh, does uh, threaten democracy in many ways. So I think uh, it's not necessarily like meaning let's legalize everywhere uh, by all means, but it's a bit of taking uh, a different look at some of the countries we're dealing with and how these challenges can be better addressed uh, by, by means that are not necessarily only criminalizing uh, all users or all distributors in the same way. Sure. So. Um, Francesca, is it time to reform the World Bank? I think we all know the answer, <laughs> but should we be holding our breath is the question. Can I actually uh, 
uh, before getting to that, that I think that actually you, you, if you have seen the pattern in my remark, you know what I'm going to say. But mm -hmm. can I step in on the legalization of drugs uh, question? Um, please, please. And uh, yeah. share, uh, yeah, share a thought that I was listening in the conversation. Yes, we do need to think outside the box. And for doing that, that we need to collaborate, uh, not just within an organization, not just across organization, but across a spectrum of people thinking together. So, you know, we really need to do that. Now, let me turn around the question. If uh, um, the proposal to legalize drugs is because we are trying to take away profit um, or opportunity for profit uh, to organize crime uh, um, organization, I'm not sure that that is the solution, unfortunately. Why? I know, as many of you may have uh, detected from my accent, I'm Italian and I know very well the history of my own country. Mafia groups uh, will go where the money flow. If we make legal drugs, they will find other way to extract the money and to continue to survive. So we are simply removing, almost like a, in a medical met metaphor, a symptom, one of the symptoms, but we are not addressing the cause. And I think that when we think about solution, we needed to think about both. We needed to think about what are the causes that are making these organized crime groups able to survive and strive so well. Just they will just move and look for a different source of income. Um, and we will still go back in a few years to say, okay, what do we do next? So yes, we need to think outside the box, but we need to really have a deep understanding of what the problem are and look at the causes, not just try to cover up a symptom and try to address uh, uh, something on the surface. And I'm afraid that sometimes for the enthusiasm, driven by the enthusiasm, we want to do something we are forgetting that the causes are much more profound. So about the restructuring the World Bank, or for that matter, any organization, I believe that things need to evolve. And if we are not doing a good job, or if we have exhausted our reason of existence, absolutely. Now, right now, um, I'm the first one, actually, uh, to push for any type of improvement and greater accountability. And this is something that I think that is very important and I want to emphasize. The World Bank is undergoing a profound uh, restructuring right now, and I'm not sure what will emerge because it's very unclear. But one thing that I do hope, uh, it will emerge an organization that uh, is much more transparent and open, is much more accountable for any decision it makes, and actually provide leadership. Now, this is about the World Bank. Um, but one of the big, actually, to use something that we we'll say before, elephant in the room um, that we haven't talked about it, as bad as the governance system of the World Bank can be, we still have some mechanism to bring issue to a table, to discuss them between different stakeholders, because this is a multinational organization. It's a very different, different type of dialogue when you're interacting with bilateral donor. And there it's much more difficult to maintain collaboration, to really think about what is the best, uh, the better good for the country, for the situation, and not just for the donor that you represent. And I think that that's also something that has to be brought to the table. Um, one more point that I wanted to uh, so the, the, the issue about the donor community is much more complex, and I do think that all of us collectively should be pushing to, uh, toward a model where there is much greater transparency, openness, and accountability on any type of organization involved uh, in development uh, activity. And one point that actually I hadn't uh, um, uh, touch and our colleague from Ghana reminded me with his comment about the access to information law. One of the biggest challenges lately has been realizing how much 
sophisticated many of our counterparts have become in passing law and then never implementing them. So, um, you know, there are these beautiful laws in many countries around the world that they are the envy, they could be the envy of many of the European countries, but they are sitting in a shelf. They are never implemented in part because, let me, you know, let me give Fr you Francesca, if you don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stop you there because um, we, we're almost out of time and I want to take one more round. Great, thank you. Um, Camino, are you still with us? London to Mali. I don't think so. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the last round of questions. Yes, there's a couple of questions here in the middle, very briefly. And I think that sort of exhausts the questions as well. Uh, Mark Pyman, Transparency International Defense and Security Program. Uh, is organized crime getting worse or better? Question for artists. All my information from official agencies is it's getting rapidly worse. I'd be interested in your official view. Uh, for Frank and Francesca, a security and military are often central to organized crime's power. Guinea-Bissau, it's 100%. Honduras, it's 100%. Mali, it's 100%. What do you think in your regions? And finally, for Catalina and uh, Camino, if she's still there, uh, we've talked a lot about the problems. Surely one of the solutions has to be a new sort of coalition that actually involves national civil society, international civil society, and the anti-organized crime agencies. I can't see how it's going to make any progress without this. Uh, what do you think? Great, thank you. And lady in the second row as well. National leaders are colluding at intergovernmental organization. Uh, one recent example is well-known example, the Commonwealth 50 Asian and African leaders colluded with, uh, uh, colluded to have uh, Sri Lankan president as the Chogum the chair, though in the last seven, eight years, he has not been investigating murders and uh, disappearances. He has not been publishing the reports on investigations on corruption and so many other things. And he has become authoritarian by passing uh, 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 amendments to constitution. And he, ha he can appoint the chief justice, anybody. He can appoint anybody in the world, in the country, yes. So we have to look at. Uh, um, the, the recently, Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations produced a report two months ago uh, by experts from all around the world uh, on uh, how short-termism of politics and trade uh, has brought us to this mm -hmm. global uh, gridlock. So we need to, <laughs> I mean, they have made rec uh, recommendations. Okay. And are you Sri Lankan? Yes. Uh, and your name is? Right Great, thank you very much. Uh, that's all right. Uh, and one final question from the web um, from uh, Valentina Zuri, who's a researcher at the University of Florence. Um, it's directed at you, uh, Frank, and it's about uh, the sort of the transactional nature of some of the trafficking that comes through West Africa. Because she was commenting on one of your slides, which had an arrow pointing all the way up to Syria and the Middle East, and it's a really important point uh, to comment on. on West Africa might be the landing point, but it is by no means the, the end destination. Now, we've got a few points here. Um, just, you know, we'll, we'll go uh, one by one and just pick up on, on whatever points you want to comment on or any direct questions you want to get back on. Katalina, we'll start with you. Thank you. Well, there are a few. Um, you mentioned uh, having a coalition between uh, na international uh, civil society organizations, international civil society organizations, and law enforcement agencies. And I would add even, uh, journalists, in, uh, investigative journalists. Uh, for some of these cases, uh, it, they have been keen in shedding light into this. So I think the role of the media here has been absolutely key and uh, sort of reinforcing uh, their capacity to operate. Uh, in some of the cases, for example, in the Baltic states, uh, we were seeing it was uh, in Latvia where it's believed that uh, the main oligarchs in the country actually bought one of the main media outlets. Uh, so it's a very powerful way for organized crime to uh, avoid uh, the uh, power of the media and the press. So I would add uh, those, but definitely there needs to be sort of a better way for uh, law enforcement uh, agencies to collaborate with uh, civil society organizations because it's uh, the only way that uh, m many of these cases uh, come to light. In Colombia, 
Ethiopia, for example, uh, our in many cases, uh, for example, there it's quite well known these parapolitics uh, cases where three quarters of uh, Columbus Congress were basically financed by paramilitary forces. And it's because of uh, uh, civil society organizations in the country that these cases uh, have been uh, seeing the light of day. So definitely. Um, yeah, I'll leave the floor to other. Sure. Yes, um, the question about organized criminality. So it's a philosophy, philosophical one's question, <laughs> of course. But um, uh, I think there is two two answers. One is global and one is local. Of course, locally in uh, many European countries, we can say that the organized criminality is going down because uh, Latvia and other Baltic states, uh, so uh, of course people are no, not so afraid about organized criminal groups than it was in the 90s and uh, in the end of the 90s when I started uh, to work as police officer, so the situation has changed completely. Uh, globally, uh, I can agree that uh, the situation is not so good in China, and uh, if we're looking to the numbers, uh, to the budget, uh, which uh, the, the, the international associations are putting to law enforcement agencies, for example, in European Union, it's Europol, and their budget from year to year is rising up, so it's uh, not a good sign that uh, organized criminality is going down. So. Um, probably in Europe, uh, in, in, as a union, uh, it, is a, it is a problem still. Great, thank you. Uh, Frank, let me just qualify that other question, the question we got from the web. It was in relation to uh, money from the trade financing things like com the conflict in Syria and, and, and other sort of security risks and terror risks and things like that. Uh, and to what extent that's something that is a concern for you. And I realize we never got back on the, uh, the UK government and where they need to go to research. So if anyone has any recommendations. I would say start with ODI, but anyway. Okay, uh, for your question, uh, I, I can address it from uh, uh, our own perspective, which is the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center, because we do extensive work related to organized crime. And even though um, sometimes we have to take it in bits and pieces, we have <laughs> programs on regional small arms and light weapons, which is, uh, when it comes to organized crime, one of the main uh, threats to stability on the African continent. Uh, we also do have uh, programs on um, uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. So, uh, and we have, in all this, we have done extensive research that are available and accessible if you want to. So um, that's what I can say from our perspective. Um, the second question is um, security and organized crime. Um, what's the experience? Um, from uh, if I should address it from a, a, a Ghanaian point of view, um, it is it's true that uh, the lack of security or stability it's, uh, it, it enables organized crime to to prosper. And um, I will cite the lack of uh, state presence in some of these countries. If you talk about Mali. Uh, there are places in Mali where the state is not present at all. In Gao, Kida, and Timbuktu, uh, the state is virtually not present. And that uh, enables uh, criminal networks to create their own system of governance uh, to rule and then perpetrate uh, further illicit activity. But also, um, they also fill a very important gap in uh, social service provision. Because And that even exists in Ghana, because where you have the state unable to provide the much needed social services like water, electricity, uh, food, uh, these organized criminal networks are able to fund some of these activities. And that is one way that they legitimize their illicit uh, activity. So d definitely the lack of security, or should I call it stability, uh, enables organized uh, crime to prosper in many of these places. Then um, the question, I am not sure if I got the, the question but right, to what, extent, transnational. to what extent does it help finance things like conflicts in other parts of the world, and how much of an issue is that, not just in the Maghreb, but even further afield? Well, um, we can cite an example of uh, terrorism, because uh, we know that um, if you start from Nigeria, where Boko Haram is very uh, active, and then you come to the movement uh, MNLA uh, in Mali, and then you also come to Al-Qaeda 
these systems are all interlinked. And uh, Al Qaeda is now a, a very international terrorist organization that finds itself in many places. And therefore, and then we also know that these terrorist networks are, do not only limit themselves to terrorist activities, but they also increasingly engage in uh, drug trafficking, uh, cigarette trafficking, and other um, organized uh, crimes. So certainly, they do have uh, an effect. The interlinkages will enable them to circulate some of these activities across a uh, continent. Uh, that's all I think uh, I can say concerning that. Uh. Sure. Uh, Francesca, any, any final thoughts on any of the questions that have been asked? Um, I, the question on the defense sector and the, the role, I'm glad that the mark is actually in the audience. I, I hadn't seen uh, being connected by phone who was participating. I think that that is an area, the, um, the defense sector, um, where we are starting also to um, engage and trying to understand how we can strengthen and increase the transparency and accountability. And that clearly has an impact um, on the issue that we are discussing today, but also on issue uh, exactly of the organized crime, but also the allocation of powers. And this is very much true. Uh, in many of the countries where we work, and is also related to the um, issue of use of natural resources, which usually in countries where there is uh, um, some challenge uh, regarding the defense sector, the military sector, you also tend to have, through my anecdotal evidence, um, some uh, a large natural resources that can be exploited. So this is an area at the sector level where increasingly we are trying to get engaged. And so I hope uh, um, that you know we will have we will make some progress. But here we really need to think outside the box on how to be able to change the dynamics uh, uh, in these sectors. Thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, th that brings us to the end of the discussion. Um, all that remains is uh, to just kind of try to somehow bring this back together. Um, I mean, we've covered so much ground. We've, we've looked at so many issues. Now, I'm not a uh, drugs expert, uh, both professionally or recreationally. Um, <laughs> and I'm not an expert on Latin America or the Baltic states. But uh, one of the things, you know, we've, we've, talk we've spoken about the various ways in which this compromises the democratic process, the political process, global power, lack of global political will, security, and so on. What stands out more than anything to me, and really kind of the central issue to me here, is that not, no one seems to be really talking about this seriously at all. Um, and it is amazing just how rarely the topic comes up, which is why I started by commending ODI for even putting this together, because, sorry, what is that, red, red, black? Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you know, in, in res with respect to Africa, and I can only really comment on Africa, uh, it's amazing how rarely this is talked about. Uh, and you know, as our colleague from Somalia remarked, it's frightening that if Ghana, which is in every way considered one of the success stories of Africa, has been compromised to this extent by the drug trade in West Africa, what does that say for countries where institutions are weaker? Uh, and where you know the ability to address this is is much more difficult. And I would say the one thing that needs to happen is uh, someone needs to start getting serious about developing some sort of framework here to address this internationally, because uh, clearly there is none. And uh, you know frameworks are great; they are not the solution. But uh, not even having a framework is even more scary than at least having one. Um, no doubt this won't go away. As Archer said, this will never end. Um, I hope he's wrong. <laughs> I fear he's right, though. Anyway, uh, thank you very much to the audience. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Uh, thank you very much to anyone who's joined us in cyberspace. And thanks again to ODI for hosting and for the invitation. And uh, on that note, uh, we're done. Thanks a lot.